Um, actually, I lied to Craig. I do have a, a joke I did want to tell. So. Uh, this, this guy goes, and it's only because my dad always told me I need to tell a joke when I open up. It's just you know, a way to sort of you know, keep things kind of light. Uh, so this guy goes to the zoo because he sees a help one and sign. And uh, the zoo guy says, well, you know, the monkey, he died, and we don't want to disappoint the children, so we want you to put on this monkey suit and just go in the cage and pretend like you're a monkey. It'll make the kids happy. And the guy says, I know nothing about being a monkey. He says, it doesn't matter. Just go in the cage. Just, you know, do whatever you can do to look like a monkey. You got the suit there. The kids will be happy, and it'll be great. So he does that. He puts on the monkey suit, and he goes into the, the, the cage. The kids go by. They look at the monkey, and he kind of walks around. The kids gather, you know, increasing interest. Then uh, he jumps up on a tree. So swinging back and forth, and the kids are really excited, really interested in seeing this. But accidentally, the guy swings into the lion's cage. The lion slowly creeps up to him, and the guy says, Get me out of here, get me out of here. And the lion says, Shut up, you get us both fired. <laughs> Thank you. Anyway, um, the, the talk I'm, I'm putting out here is called Interconnection Strategies for ISTs. And this is really based upon a lunch meeting that Peter Lothberg and Ted Hardy and I had at IATF, where the, the, the notion was, um, why do people use exchange environments? Why do people use direct circuits for interconnection? What are the trade-offs? Or as Peter put it, why the hell should I drag a piece of fiber into an exchange? Uh, so this is really an examination, some research that we did with a lot of interviews, uh, putting together a financial model that shows financially and technically why does it make sense to use an exchange? And when does it make sense to use direct circuits for interconnecting ISPs. And what I, what I put together here is um, a white paper that I've walked through about 50 or 70 uh, some people through. And each time I walk people through it, a lot of the ISPs are in this room. Um, I, I get additional data, validation, additional pushback, and so forth. So this has been through a number of iterations. And I'm willing to make this, this, uh, this white paper available to folks um, if you like. I lost my mic. Are we up? Yeah, we're out of batteries. Batteries. Do you have any batteries? Ah, battery. There is a man. Oh, there's a man. Yeah. 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 Okay, you, you want to go ahead while um, while you're putting that. Oh, okay. All right. So um, one thing first is that there's an assumption since we're comparing the direct circuit inner exchange model versus using an exchange point. One of the assumptions I need to state up front is that we have a certain model for an exchange environment that we're applying to the comparison. The, the basic idea here is that you have a, an infrastructure company who puts in place an environment in which multiple carriers will be coming in to sell access services to multiple ISPs. These ISPs can get the benefits of fiber diversity and increasing size pipes from multiple providers. The ISPs in this exchange model can interact either in a peering or a transit relationship to buy or sell capacity. And also there's a small set of folks in the content provider space up here that insist upon having multi-homing abilities so they can buy transit from multiple folks and, and have the marketplace work. The key notion here, though, is that the folks who are operating this environment are not carriers, they're not ISCs, and they're not content providers. They're simply providing an environment in which these interactions can take place. And you'll see this is an important element um, as we go on through the model. So just to state up front, this is the exchange-based model that we're using in the financial model. So the, the trade-off is uh, direct circuit interconnections that a lot of folks have uh, been doing out in the industry. And the idea here is that you have national backbones illustrated in these different colors and regional interconnections that are typically uh, dedicated circuits of, of you know, speeds of anywhere from OC, or actually down to T1, all the way up to OC3, OC12. Uh, OC12 is becoming more popular. But for the purpose of this discussion, we're going to start out as OC3 for interconnections. 
And typically what happens is each of the ISPs will pay half of the cost of the circuit for interconnecting in that region. And that's either in the form of um, one company will pay for the circuits in one region and the other company will pay for the circuits to interconnect them in the other region. But by and large, it's, it's half. Each side pays half in this model. And if you look at the cost of, of this interconnection strategy, you see it's proportional to the number of folks that you interconnect with and you're paying half of the cost for each of those interconnection <coughs> circuits. Does that make sense? Yeah? Okay. The exchange-based model is based upon replacing the regional circuits with a big pipe into an exchange. One key difference here, though, is unlike over here in the direct circuit model where each party is paying half of the cost, each party is paying the full freight of this big pipe into the exchange. Within the exchange, the exact same interconnection can occur. That is, uh, pieces of fiber can be run in between cages and be operated at OC3, OC12, OC48, whatever speed you see fit. But the key point is that uh, the exact same exchange that occurs in here is occurring using pieces of fiber. There's no switch at all involved in this model. The same interconnection that happens over here happens over here. And again, the key difference is you're paying only half the cost of the circuits there, but you're paying the full freight for the OC12N. Another key component here in the exchange model is that there is aggregation possible over that OC12, which really means that if you have partly used pipes here, you aggregate all that traffic together and you end up having more bandwidth available above and beyond what you would have if you just do, did the direct circuit interconnection because these pipes aren't completely fully filled. Uh, Rodney Joffrey tells me that um, you can get anywhere between 2 to 1 to 3 to 1 um, uh, bandwidth efficiency, aggregation efficiency. Um, the, the number that we used was 2 to 1, meaning that we can get uh, anywhere from, um, let's say, 6 OC3s of inner exchange going on here and still not threaten filling up that OC12. And again, the assumption is that you're not using all of those pipes to full capacity. The nice thing about a financial model, too, is that we can change the numbers for the efficiency. So the, end, the, the bottom line is the cost of doing this ends up being the cost of that big circuit in, plus the interconnection that occurs over here. And then, of course, since you're coming into an exchange, there are, in fact, rack fees and cross-connect fees and such. So in adding these things together, you get a comparison like this. So let's take a look where you have five ISPs that are exchanging traffic over here in a particular region. You've got N minus one times the cost of the circuits. The, the number that we got from talking with folks at, at Level 3 and Quest um, and a variety of other folks ended up being fairly variable in, in this sort of range. The number we actually used was $11,400 per month for an OC3. That's based on an actual quote we got from MCI. So when we do the calculation, the cost for one of these guys to interconnect with each of these other guys at OC3 levels ends up costing about $22,800 a month. And again, that ends up being a reasonably good deal because you're only paying for half of the cost of the circuits on each side. If you do the exact same interconnection in an exchange, uh, the problem is you've got to pay for this OC12, which again from the MCI quote that we got was about $23,000. Uh, you have to pay that full freight. And then there's some, some rack fees and such. So the bottom line cost is $24,900 a month. So for at least n equals 5 here, it makes more sense to do the direct circuit interconnection than it does to use an exchange. So then the question was, given that, what do the economics look like when you go beyond 5? So this is a graph of the cost savings of using an exchange over using the direct circuit interconnection model. So you see down here, this cost here of bringing in that OC12 so you can exchange traffic with other parties at OC3 means that you're losing money. It's, it's not actually particularly efficient if all you want to do is interconnect with some parties. For example, this first point, there are two participants. You brought in an OC12 to exchange traffic at OC3 with one participant. It just doesn't make any sense. You go up here, though, and you can take advantage of the aggregation efficiencies so you can have more than four OC3s exchanged within the exchange. And you get to a certain point here where you get that seventh OC3, and you can't fit that seventh OC3 back over the aggregated OC12 pipe. So you have to go out and buy an OC48 pipe 
which again brings you down below the red line, so it ends up costing more money to do this model than using the direct circuit interconnection model. But look what happens when you start carving out OC3s out of that OC48. You start getting to a point where it actually makes a lot more sense to use an exchange. You get up to the point up here, you're saving about, oh, let's say about $80,000 per month in interconnection costs when using an exchange before you have to go from that OC48 to an OC96. So you end up having a lot of points here that look like they're saving a whole lot of money. The other key piece here, though, is, this is look at the number of participants you've got to go to in order to get these cost savings. Um, I would point out, though, that this is OC, carving out OC3s, right? As you carve out OC12s, you're going to be accelerating up this curve. If you start doing exchange with the right keys at OC48, you're going to be very quickly into this black part where you're saving a fair amount of money. Does this make sense? Yeah? The other thing we took a look at for the, for the study was um, assume that people wanted to explore using dark fiber into the exchange as an alternative to buying circuits. So you remember that you had that step curve going up and you got bigger and bigger circuits. Um, in talking with some Nortel folks and talking with some folks who do some trenching, in fact, last night, talking with some of the, the Quest guys and uh, some, some guys from MCI, we sort of broke this down a little further. Um, the numbers we got for dragging, for actually doing the trenching, the most expensive part that you could do, you trench into the ground, um, was about $100,000 per kilometer. So if you assume you're five miles away from an exchange, that's about eight kilometers. That's $800,000 for the trenching. The light gear at either end, the Nortel guys tell me, it costs about a quarter of a million dollars per side. So if you add that, so that's $1.3 million. We rounded up $1.3 million to about $2 million, saying that you know, maybe we're off a little bit here. So $2 million, when you amortize $2 million over 20 years, which is life of fiber, you come up with a cost of about $45,000, $50,000. By the way, that's about the price of an OC48. So that's why you see down here around that five point, just like before when you had the, the OC12, around that five point you start ending up being in the black and saving a fair amount of money because you can light up that piece of dark fiber with DWDM you can carve out OC3s as you need them and scale very inexpensively by bringing in this pipe into the exchange. And again, this is the cost savings of using dark fiber into the exchange. So the point of this whole thing is facilities-based providers win big in this environment. So this slide compares the, each, of the, each of the three models that we talked about. Here you see the cost of using the direct circuit interconnection model. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, I'll hold it like this. Uh, here we have the cost of doing the direct circuit interconnection, just carving out, or actually asking for additional OC3s from the, the telcos, and you see it scales linearly. This is the cost of using an exchange, bringing in increasing size pipes into the exchange to exchange traffic, and you see the majority of this area here is, is below the cost of doing the direct circuit interconnection. Once you get past this point of about five interconnections. And then of course, as I said, uh, facilities-based providers win really big because this, the, once you get the, um, the fiber in place, you can carve out seamlessly OC3s, OC12s, OC48s out of the, the wavelengths and you can grow extremely cost effectively, which is why a lot of folks are going to um, the dark fiber into the exchange. So far though, we've talked only about uh, the cost savings, that is, um, the trade-off of doing exchange of traffic using direct circuits versus using the exchange. There's also another type of activity that can go on within an exchange that's worth at least taking a look at, which is the revenue generation. When you have an exchange, you have additional space in which transit customers show up. Content providers can show up. You have um, ISP points of presence, international presences, and the ability to, in some models, buy rack space for resale. And the, the key thing here is you cannot do this if you simply interconnect using a piece of circuit from one provider to the other provider. Does this make sense? Yeah. So again, fitting with the, the model, we talked about cost savings and we actually had some numbers associated with that cost savings. Uh, let, let's toss out some numbers based upon the conversations I've had with a, with a bunch of folks. Um, in, in talking with uh, Dave Rand and, and looking at his Cook Report interview, uh, he tells us that 
A DS3 costs him from UUNet about $65,000 per month. So if UUNet's in a facility and they sell a DS3, there's an incremental revenue beyond the exchange of traffic. There's an incremental revenue possibility for UUNet of about $65,000 and you know, times 12, you end up getting that big number over there. Um, if you have a provider that also sells an OC3, you get the revenue of about 120,000. Um, the OC3 number actually had a, a wide variance. Um, the, the UNET guys told me about anywhere between about 85,000 and 180,000 was the, the transit price for an OC3. The 120 seemed like a reasonable round figure. I don't want to quibble too much about the numbers except to point out that this incremental revenue is fairly substantial and it's not possible if you're doing interconnection solely through direct circuit interconnection. The, the other thing I wanted to, to hit on just real briefly was uh, a question went out to the analog list um, where, uh, I forget the guy's name, he asked, uh, what do people see as the future of the exchange? Um, in, in thinking about the interconnection that we've been discussing here, we've been talking mostly on this side of the equation, carriers bringing in uh, multiple big pipes, uh, dark fiber providers bringing in uh, dark fiber for the uh, internet service providers and the interconnection between the internet service providers. But there's a whole section over here that we believe remains uh, fairly untapped. Um, we believe that the future of the internet exchange will include some notions of virtual ISPs. These, these guys who will come in and buy transit from internet service providers, buy DSL access, provider access, wireless access, dial and modem, um, tokens for shared dial and modem pools, um, email services, and so forth. Tie these things together and offer a new package that didn't exist before to an, an environment, to um, a new customer base. If you can imagine um, some number of these things deployed across the nation. And the other thing I, I want to sort of hit on here before I go there is the, the sparing notion. Um, of course, we all know that one thing you really want to do is have backup equipment in case um, you know, a uh, router goes south and you can't bring it back up just by rebooting it. Uh, we've been talking with Cisco and Juniper and they have no problem at all in providing uh, spares in exchange environments for folks if there's a customer demand for it. They often en enter into contracts where they have a four hour and a 24 hour response time to replace gear that is, that is broken. Uh, another thing that's possible with the exchange that, that seems pretty interesting is imagine if these spares can be turned into online devices, that is, someone calls up and says, we want to put in place this national backbone. You have equipment sitting there as a spare and some extra spares. We want to buy that from you. Put it into a rack. Enter into contracts with some of these guys. Um, maybe they're going to buy dark fiber from a dark fiber provider to the other, ex the other exchange facilities and be able to turn up in a matter of days a nationwide back when that includes DSL access. It's, it's something that didn't exist before when you started exploring uh, the, the expansion of services. So anyway, I just, I just tossed that out because it was uh, one of the questions that was asked on the NetOg list and it's, it's particularly interesting to me. Uh, the, the other key point that I highlighted down here is um, the implication for this type of environment, if it does in fact go this way, the implication is that there's going to be greater bandwidth demand at the exchange, increasing the need for the scalability of pipes, larger and larger pipes into an exchange, and larger and larger interconnection traffic between internet service providers within an exchange. So uh, just to sort of wrap things up, uh, from the study, from the research that we've, we've done, uh, it looks like the number is about five. If you're going to interconnect with five or fewer other parties, and all you want to do is interconnect. You don't you know, want to do anything about this revenue stuff that we talked about. Then it makes more sense to use direct circuits. And that is, again, because the cost of the circuits is a half cost. The other guy pays the other half. And there's some technical issues there, too, that, that make it somewhat attractive. There's some simplicity issues. Um, but there are al also some um, developments in the technology now that we heard about all yesterday where the optical gear ends up you know, turning some... Um, so some pretty great efficiencies when you can carve out uh, additional pipes of increasing size. When you can light up dark fiber on either end and carve out OC3s, OC12s, OC48s out of a wavelength and then just go to the next wavelength. You can scale these pipes into the exchange very, very large 
and the traffic within the exchange between ISPs can also scale very, very large. You end up having a much more scalable environment than if you have simply a circuit that you have to go through the telco to upgrade and, and the time involved and such. Um, as I said, facilities-based providers win really big using the dense wave, multi, um, dense wave division multiplexing. Um, large bandwidth, either OC12s or large numbers of participants, escalate you up through that curve. So if you use circuits, you end up having that curve, that step curve that I described earlier. Um, the other key point is there is an incremental transit sale available in an exchange model that doesn't exist in the direct circuit <coughs> model. And finally, um, all this is, is listed in the white paper, including the financial models that were used to generate all the graphs and everything that you see here. And I'd be glad to get you guys a copy if you want. Uh, just get me a business card and I'll, I'll email you a copy of the document. The last thing is that I wanted to thank some folks who uh, took the time to read the white paper, to give me feedback, to give me you know, numbers, and um, to, to give me um, support. <laughs> And uh, at this point, I can take some questions. Any questions? Uh, I have one, Bill. I, yes. I saw some of your plans last night that you had a kitchen in some of the new facilities. Will you have a microwave? <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 seriously, uh, any, <clears throat> any questions? Uh, actually, one question of the audience. How many people have gotten a copy of the white paper? Sean, do you want to do you want to take that? Where are you, Sean? See, the, the, the question was: um, there have been a number of outages that were directly um, contributed or directly caused by um, uh, kitchen fires within exchange facilities or POPs. So I was wondering if, if uh, Sean had the source. I don't see him out here. Okay. Well, thank you, Bill. Hold on. Is this about microwaves, Steve? No, I said I didn't want to let them off the hook that easily. Okay. How come you didn't do any financial models for interconnects with a switch at the center? Um, the, the question was, why didn't you do the financial models with a switch in the middle? And the reason really was, I wanted to compare apples to apples. If, if you look at um, what these guys are doing here in terms of the scalability and the congestion issues and, and all the kind of stuff that goes along with having um, a switch. I'm just sort of waving my hands a lot here because there have been issues in the past with congestion in, in the switch environment and such. I can avoid those arguments completely and people won't go screaming at me saying switches are bad or you know naps are congestion points or that kind of stuff. I can avoid those arguments completely if I simply do the exact same interconnection using direct circuits as I do using uh, pieces of fiber within an exchange. Fair enough? Thank you.